In a way, you feel like you're a leper. You're different to everyone else if you're looked after. Not many people took an interest in what I was doing, and it can make you think, what's the point? I got put back a year, so I'm not as clever as I should be. It was like really sad because I thought I should be up there with the others, but I wasn't. The statistics are that children in care do not do as well as normal children, and I just really disagree with it. Fair enough, it's proven, but some kids can do just as well. Tyrone is a Year 7 pupil now living in a stable foster placement. He's successful at school, but with only 11% of looked-after children achieving five good GCSEs, compared with 56% of all children, clearly many looked-after children aren't thriving in education. Come on, stop messing around at the table. In this programme, looked-after children and care leavers share their experience in care and education and we explore some of the ways to improve their path. Children who are in care are like any other kids. They don't come with horns, they don't come with halos. You know, they're like every other child, but the, the thing that they've got in common when they come into care is that they've already got a history of being let down by adults in their lives. Stefan is in year 10 and lives with foster carers. Nadia and Zach are both care leavers who live independently. Nadia is now studying graphic design at university and Zach is a mental health worker studying for a qualification in health and social care. When you do first go into foster care, you know, it's, it's upsetting and traumatising it is because your world's changed, isn't it? You haven't got your family around you, you haven't got friends, you move to a different house, you have to fit around them. I don't know, when I first moved into one placement, I thought, you know, I was walking around like a mouse. And I was like, I'm allowed to do this, I'm allowed to do that, and it's upsetting, you know. Can I make myself a sandwich? Will I get told off? Also, for me, when I went, it was I was picked up from school one afternoon, and I wasn't even aware, then I was taken that evening, and I had to go to school the next day, and I'd been taken up my home and everything. I had no school books, I had no equipment or anything, and I had to walk in with, with I'm really unprepared and totally changed around, back into school the next day. Hello, and Antonio speaking. When a child goes into foster care, it can be a tremendously traumatic time. There's no way I'll allow a child to explain to a teacher in every lesson. So I will send a memo out to the staff. I will get hold of the books for them. I'll make sure they've got all the uniforms so they don't feel any different because there's enough going on in their life without the added complication of school. Um, I've been to, let me think, um... One, um... Eight. Eight schools. In the beginning of year four, we sort of moved to a different sort of town and we were moving around a lot. And so therefore, I think I missed most of year four out of school. Um, and then when I started back at school again, I went straight into year five. So I can remember sort of looking at other people's work and my handwriting was awful compared to theirs and trying to almost compete with them because I thought, oh dear, you know, my work isn't right here. They need what all other children need to succeed in education. They need continuity of care, they need stability, they need consistency of handling, they need trust. And perhaps above everything else, they need an adult in their life that's always going to put them first. A good parent. Miss Antonio? Oh, come in, come in. Sit yourself down, what can I do for you? Um, all the looked after children that I've spoken to they need an element of support and understanding, but at the same time, they want to be exactly the same as every other pupil in the school. So the problem is getting that balance. How to achieve that is that I discuss with the child which key people they want to know about them. Um, I just used to uh, see a, a certain teacher that I, I just... I liked and I gelled with, and um, when I used to go and see him most lunch times, um, I used to talk about all sorts. And he was really good because he just listened. The poor bloke had to sacrifice his lunchtime, um, but he just allowed me to do that, and that really helped me. 
I wouldn't expect a designated teacher to necessarily have the closest personal relationship with every looked after child, yes. but the designated teacher must make sure that somebody has a good relationship with each child and is prepared to learn the child. What I like to do with looked after children is to keep their background as confidential as possible. Obviously, certain aspects of their life need to be known to certain staff so that people are not asking them inappropriate questions. I had to do a family tree and being in foster care, I've only seen half my family and I didn't know the other half of my family. And it was quite difficult to do it and um, they did it as homework as well. And I came home and I tried to do it and then I couldn't do it because I didn't know it. And it got me quite upset. Yeah, excellent, keep going. Enter. Enter. Good. Teachers we should avoid that happening by just keeping it away in your head that um, that kid is in foster care and there's certain things like what they can't do. And like just, just to have that in mind would help. I hate people oh, I know what you're going through, this is how you're going through it, I know what you feel like. You don't know how, you f how we feel like, because you've never been in foster care, you've never had that experience, so how can you say you know what you're going through? So it's a lo load of rubbish. I think also it's about treating everybody as individuals, and it's about teachers asking us, look, we're aware of your situation, what would you like us to do to support you with that? Coming to school made it worthwhile. Care leaver Ian shares the strategies that helped him thrive at school. Need to come to school really. Football kept me interested in coming to school because it, it was something that to get me into school straight away. Something that I wanted to be in school to do. Right. So that's really what kept you regularly coming in when times were bad. Yeah. And then your brother came as well. He wasn't living with you, was he? No, he was in a in foster care with someone else. He's um. He was based in Mole Scream, his foster home as well. I remember when you were in the sixth form that he used to come and see you. He used to have someone work with him all the time. I think you spoke to her and said that Georgie can come and sit in for a lesson for an hour. He was doing his work beside me while I was doing all my course work. Yeah, so we could get an hour, usually an hour, an hour and a half a day, we should, some, some days we get to spend together. Because normally children of his age wouldn't be allowed in this sixth, in sixth form block. No, no one was allowed in the sixth form. You get, yeah. you get detention if you come in the sixth form. And didn't form. he used to watch you play football? Yeah, um, on a Wednesday, because it was in leisure time, le last lesson, lesson five on a Wednesday, if we had a home game, Georgia would always let him watch me on the field. Obviously, I didn't get to see him out of school because um, I weren't 100% sure where his foster parents were. Plus, I had to um, go through my own mother to sort out visiting time to go and see him and that. Him being able to come and spend some time in my lesson room with me during the week or watch me play football, obviously, got to spend time together. Yeah. So, so, so that helped helped us both because we had that bit more more contact with each other. There was another reason that you stayed on in the sixth form besides your love of football. What was that? Because I felt safe and settled for the first time in my life. You know, I didn't think I was ready to go straight out into work. I felt I was just ready to kind of do another you know another year, maybe another two years of education before I you know felt you know with my self esteem completely right to to, to go out into to to know work and. So, I felt, you know, be, being settled definitely made, you know, helped my decision to stay on at, at, at school. One of the things which NSERC is really interested in promoting is a greater awareness of the emotional impact of looked-after children's previous lives. Uh, across children's services, we would want uh, all of those who are caring or educating young people to be aware of these issues. I, went, I left my foster place when we just had a petty argument. I went to this farm, it was a farm, and they, they didn't lock me upstairs. They said, I'm not allowed to come downstairs. I was upstairs for like 12 hours. I think it, was, it, it felt like I was being abused and I was just there for their money. Do you know what I mean? Like, and to me, that, that, that's upset me from this day. That really you know, to be locked upstairs, and it was like a new year. I was up there, like, I don't know, I, I felt if I stayed there, I would have been abused more. It was mentally, it wasn't physical or anything like that, it was a mental abuse.
And then you're taking all these problems with you to school, aren't you? And yeah, sometimes just... they can come out because sometimes I think the reason that some young people are misbehaving at school is because they're releasing their, their anger and everything they can't show in the circumstance of living at home. And that's where it comes out. What recent research has shown is that overwhelming stress produces real lasting injuries in the brain. And that's what we mean by trauma. Kate is part of a company that provides online qualifications and training for children's services. She lectures on the neurological and emotional aspects of looked after and other vulnerable children. The impairments of brain function that may be caused by early trauma in infancy or in, in young childhood can make it very difficult for children to think, to process ideas, to process sensory information. These all have a major impact on the child's ability to learn. In addition, children may have great difficulty in self-regulating. That means that they may struggle in any social environment. They may struggle to be socially acceptable. They may struggle to develop social learning skills. There's a whole range of global impacts in terms of the children's ability to function, especially in such a complex world as school. The Kaspari Foundation trains teachers to work therapeutically with children whose learning is affected by social and emotional experience. For many children, not just looked after children, all of their behaviour has to become organised around defending themselves against the worries of uncertainty and adversity, rather than developing the mechanisms for dealing with it. And it means that when they're challenged socially and emotionally and cognitively and by learning and by relationships, they have to resort to a defensive behaviour that protects them from feeling so vulnerable. And that's the behaviour that alarms the grown-ups, the adults, the professionals around them. My belief is that if we can make sense of this behaviour, we can facilitate their emotional and developmental progress rather than simply react to their behaviour, often in a very punitive and excluding way. It's important that we understand what goes on in the classroom between the teacher and the young person. Looked after children have particular needs that arise out of their life experiences. If we use an assessment using attachment, we can find that a young person has a particular learning style, which will require a, a particular teaching style. Uh, teachers are very good at being able to assess the cognitive needs of young people. They need to be equally good at being able to assess the emotional needs of young people and build that into the individual teaching plan for each young person. So look what's happening to this beam now. All babies and children seek a secure relationship or attachment to a carer in order to survive physically, socially and emotionally. Vulnerable children, including looked after children, have generally experienced a less than secure attachment, which can result in differing emotional programming and behaviour in the classroom. The teacher's greatest tool is the learning task, and enabling children to learn through the task is what their daily job is about. And it's in the context of a relationship with the teacher. And there are some children who, in the nature of their adversity, find the relationship unreliable and therefore it's safer to engage with them through the task. So the teacher has a way of diverting attention from the relationship into the task and maintaining that safe area of learning. There are some children whose expectation of the adult is to be very intensely involved with the adult, who can't bear not to have the adult's full attention. For these children, the task can seem like a very dangerous intrusion. They don't want to be involved in the learning task because they may lose the attention of the adult. The teacher's skill in differentiating the task can set the task into small, doable steps so that the child experiences small periods of independence reinforced by the teacher's support, which it keeps the child on task, independent of the relationship. What are you going to find to make shadows now? I lose my concentration when I've got problems at home. I've got my social worker coming around, stuff like that, and it just gets quite stressful.
well, sometimes the teacher could be just droning on, just talking or jargon, just, you know, explaining stuff. And I'd just be looking out the window or just, you know, twitching off. I could feel myself getting a bit upset and my, my eyes started watering. So I just, you know, quickly got up and went out of class. So, you know, as, as not to other, you know, kids to see me crying. I got angry sometimes, you know, in my own head when I was thinking about things and, and you know, I could see myself seething because, you know, I knew that, that weren't right what was happening. So that, that made me sometimes run out of class as well. Dissociative children may be very unpredictable in their absences. <laughs> so they may be absent in body, mind or spirit. They may take themselves off physically from a lesson they may take themselves off mentally or spiritually and the lights are on but no one's at home. It can be really difficult for teachers to help children connect with the sensory world and actually be in contact with what's going on in the lesson. Hearing, seeing, experiencing what other children are. Hyper-aroused children may be triggered by neutral events, neutral stimuli, to a traumatic response. The children who challenge us by their extremes of behaviour really need consistent boundaries in order to feel safe themselves. So the consistency of the school policy is hugely important. Whether a child meets someone in the corridor or in the classroom or in the playground, the responses must be reliably the same. Um, I think the overall ethos of supporting looked after children in school is to show them that you are the one steadfast thing in their school day, that you are there for them, that you know you won't let them down. Um, I think it's very important um, that they learn very quickly to trust you and that if you say you're going to do something, then you jolly well do it. Children can come to school, particularly vulnerable children, with very, very low self-esteem. And self-esteem derives from being uh, thought about, respected, cared for and liked. We use the water bottle as a shadow by using our torches. Well done! It does deserve a clap. Well done! The key thing that we're able to do in primary school is that, of course, children only really come into contact with maybe one or two adults during their day here. So they get a really good chance of forming a very effective, solid relationship with an adult. Um, and hopefully this will give them the self-esteem and the confidence to help them move successfully into their much larger secondary school. The transition from primary school to secondary school can be particularly challenging to vulnerable children. They move from a place they are known, where it's predictable and the boundaries are clear, into an enormous institution where they change classes every 40 minutes, they might have a dozen teachers throughout the week, and there are crowds of children whom they don't know. What they need is a designated teacher who appreciates their vulnerability, understands the context that they're coming from, understands that this uncertainty is likely to trigger reactive behaviour. Applemore College's Inclusion Unit is a place that aims to help all vulnerable children, okay, which can include so looked after children, learn to understand and work with their behaviours and emotions. So if you have a look at the picture, okay, they've pinned this picture up, which is their teacher dressed up as a, a girl with a handbag, yeah? And then the teacher's just come around the corner. So what do you think the teacher's feeling? Upset. Why might he be upset? Um, because everyone around the school could see him like that and take the mick out of him. Right, because they take the mick out of him. Some children will come here because their behaviours are causing difficulties within school. Some come because they need a place where they can be quiet. Some come because they need to touch base with an attachment figure within the unit. One of the main purposes of the inclusion unit is to stop children from being excluded. Children who come here with challenging behaviours can be helped to face up to the things that are going wrong for them. That's what we make them do. And it's not an easy ride and it's not an easy way out for them. Their behaviour over here is, becomes a model for how to behave when they go back into mainstream.
I think the disheartening thing for me was not many people took an interest in what I was doing. You know, a lot of people have their parents and everything to help them and, and take an interest and they push them as well. But when you're not given that extra sort of push and that extra sort of interest, then it, it's you're like, really you're like, oh, it's quite I can't disheartening. Be bothered. It's like, I can't yeah, be bothered. like nobody really cares. So no, what's, what's the point? If you don't get um, care and if you don't get pushed, you're just like, there's no point being there. What's the point of trying? Some of the encouragement and support required can come from the school. As a designated teacher, one of the jobs is to advocate for the child. That is to make sure that their needs are understood and that their rights to education are fulfilled. Sometimes it means becoming quite unpopular with staff. So you have to be prepared to spend time talking to the teachers in order to get the child back into the class if they've been excluded. Although we have the personal education plans twice a year, which are a wonderful idea to focus everybody on the needs of the looked after child, that doesn't cover it. You have to have a regular programme of monitoring and evaluating and the child has to feel supported. Every so often, I circulate all the staff of a particular looked after child and I ask them, are they working up to the standards that you would expect? I need to send the memo to all of his staff, all of the teachers that he has. Once I've gathered all that information together, I'll have a meeting with the foster carer, social worker and the child and we'll look at how this child can improve. Now that might be extra tuition, which the local authority might provide on top of the school day. That might be extra support in school. It could be just getting involved in more clubs and activities so that the child has got ways in which to get involved in school life. And that way, we try to smooth out any rough patches and we try to allow the child to make as much progress as possible. Barnet Council felt they could do even better at giving their looks after children a helping hand in education they set up the Champion Scheme. In a nutshell, really, the Looked After Children Champion Scheme is about being a pushy parent, being a pushy parent with clout. It would be great if we can, you know, get him entered for more than three or four exams because that's going to be really important to him. So I'd, I'd Paul Fallon champions the child he mentors in a staff of, meeting. Of getting some, will you Absolutely. follow that up? Yes, and you can come and meet with you and give you some feedback in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So two years ago, we asked all our top managers if they would take a special interest in just one of our children in care. And the chief executive of the council was the first to say, yes, he was up for it. So not surprisingly, everyone else in the senior management team was up for it too, because if the chief exec says it's a good thing, then that's a pretty powerful message to the rest of the management team. And we asked each one of them to get alongside our social workers, our foster carers, not to meet the children, they've got enough people in their lives, but to find out what would be necessary to give them a slightly better chance of success initially with their GCSEs. We started with the Year 11 group. And then, frankly, just to use their life experience and their management clout in the council to exercise nepotism on behalf of the children for whom we are corporate parents. In the last two years, we've moved from about 10% of our children in care getting 5A to Cs uh, to a position where last year we got 24.5% getting 5A to Cs. We've now allocated champions to the year five young people. That's because we know that that transition through from primary school to secondary school is when so many of these children start slipping back. And, and getting the right secondary school is such a difficult thing. I did it with my kid. It was far worse than going through a divorce in terms of stress, trying to get a good secondary school for my son. And one of the things we're hoping the champions can do in year five is to make sure we get them into the very best secondary schools. Not many areas have got a champion scheme. But there's absolutely no reason why the form teacher, the tutor, the class teacher can't champion in these kids themselves. Who knows more about what kids need to succeed in education than their teacher? It's really important that services are working together. 
an important key of that is communication and that is always breaking down and it's so frustrating because there is an issue sometimes that needs to be sorted out and they need to get authorization or something from another service and they're waiting for that and meanwhile the young person's still caught in the middle of it all and it's still ongoing for them and that can be really dis disruptive. Communication is the key. I have to communicate with all of the teachers and helpers and support staff on these premises. I have to communicate with the child's carers, sometimes with their parents or other family members, and also, of course, with the social workers that are in charge of them. I think the thing to do is to treat the social worker, treat the foster carer like you would a parent. Acknowledge that they're not an expert in everything. They're not an expert in education matters. They're experts in child protection, child development, all sorts of other things. They're not experts in education. And sometimes it's difficult to admit that when you're a parent. Sometimes you just need someone to say, hang on a minute, have you thought about this? I can help you with this. And, and you know, that combined with, is this good enough for my child? Should do the trick, find out who the allocated social worker is. Be dogged. They're not always great at returning calls straight away. If you don't get a return call, talk to their team manager. I've got no problem with that at all. All right, bye-bye. The communication is critical. If the child has confidence in me that this school, with me helping them, can do for them, what we would expect for any child at any school, then that is the key, I think, to success.